sharing some cheesecake with Mama. I'm gonna eat some of the <laughs> Yummy. That was my idea. Yes, it was. No. Oh. <laughs> it was a yummy idea, Tully. Yes, it's a great <laughs> idea. I always make it at Christmas time, don't I? I make it soon. I make it for Christmas Day. You know what I've been hungry for? Because it's getting that time of the year. Pumpkin pie. Yes, and gingerbread cookies. And apple pie. Mm, apple fire. <laughs> We're up to it Saturday. Maybe we can go up to Walker's and get some pumpkins and apple cider. Mm. What do you think? So if you're up to it Saturday, maybe we can go to Walker's and get some pumpkins um, for, for your faculty members. And um, apple cider. Because they make really good apple cider there. Mmm, yummy. They sell the female lights. Okay. Hello. Hello. What? <laughs> it's getting so long. So I have to brush it now every morning. So it doesn't look like a mess. <laughs> I don't want to look good for Maddie tomorrow. Thank you for being here today. I am, we are honored that so many of you invested time with our family here today. Um, this has been a nightmare of mine for um, about nine and a half years when Juliana first got sick. Um, I was hoping and praying that this day would never happen, but here we are. Shortly after we adopted our fourth child, Timothy, we believed that we were done adopting because four kids is a lot of kids, I think. So I had a hunch one day to hold a seminar to help other families adopt children in internationally, like Tammy and I had done four times prior. So I advertised that meeting quite a bit, spent a lot of money in marketing, hopefully to um, encourage families to show up. So I reserved a room about twice this size, hoping, hoping that we would be able to help many children across the world find families. So our adoption attorney, Ron Stoddard, heard about it, and he's in California, and he said, I'm flying in, expecting to have a banquet room full of people. Well, eight people showed up. You can laugh, it's okay. After the meeting, Tammy and I were up in his hotel room. Um, I was completely embarrassed, as you might imagine. And of course, when Ron would travel, he would bring his photo album of children that are waiting for moms and dads internationally. Well, since we were done adopting children, we had four, and four is enough. Yes, yes, you can agree. Four children is enough. Um, we were just flipping through the album because there was really nothing else to do. So we flipped through the album and this little girl with crossed eyes, like our Timothy had, jumped off the page at us. And we didn't know why. So of course, for those who know me intimately, I'm a crybaby, as you'll see soon, I'm sure. 
um, I began to cry and I left the hotel room sobbing and I had no idea why because we were done adopting. Maybe I'll repeat that a few more times. Four kids is enough kids. So we decided uh, that there must have been a reason why this little girl jumped off at the page at us. And months later, we traveled to Belarus and adopted this little girl. And while we were in the orphanage director's office, the orphanage director said, well, you know she's got a sister across town in another orphanage, right? What? That wasn't in the paperwork or the photographs when we were looking at them in the hotel room. So I said, we're halfway across the world. Let's go and meet this young lady. So we went across town in Minsk, Belarus that day and came back with the help of several people a few months later and brought Christina home. Juliana was always spunky and determined and a perfectionist in everything she did. Everything in Juliana's life was perfect until 2007 when we found out that Juliana had cancer in her right arm and lymph nodes. She, she suffered for many months, but she almost always had a smile on her face. She was only five years old at that time. She beat cancer that time and cancer came back again in March, a few years later. This time the cancer was in her right leg and more lymph nodes, but guess what? Surprise, Juliana beat cancer for the second time. In June 2012, we found out that Juliana had cancer for the third time, and this time it was in her chest, and it was really bad. We were given no hope that she was gonna make it, and I remember that day that I slid down the wall and I was told that she wasn't gonna survive. So since we didn't think that she was going to make it, I said, Juliana, if there were three things that you'd like to have, if you could put her down, that would be good. I said, if there were three things that you'd like to have, what would those th three things be? She said, not to be sick, a little pause. She said, a billion dollars with a B, a slightly longer pause. A puppy. Well, not long after that, we went up to Pennsylvania and we, she picked out a little dog who is here today roaming around. You'll see her. Her name's Maddie. Maddie is her dog. With raising six kids, you can imagine that you didn't want another mouth to feed, but how could you say no to a child that was given no hope at the time? But she beat cancer in record time that time. I can remember when, um, when the doctor called me just a few months after treatment started and said, John, there's no evidence of disease. And I said something to the effect of, you know, I don't drink, but I'm going to go out and get drunk. <laughs> I didn't, just so we're clear. So in March of 2014, the cancer came back, and this time it was above her right eye. But guess what? Juliana bounced back and beat it again. All during these times, Juliana beat cancer with her tiny little body that was such a tiny but mighty little body, but a big soul. On July of last year, we found out that cancer came back for the fifth time, and of course, with every attack of this disease, we were terrified. And in that same month, we found out that Juliana may qualify for a bone marrow transplant that, uh, with, that gave us a tremendous amount of hope. But there was a little glitch. Um, we had to find a match. So that process started, and I'll get to that soon. But then we found out that at the end of last year, the cancer came back after she beat it. I, I've lost count now. The fifth time, the cancer came back again. All during these times, there's been a doctor that has stood by our side, closer than any that we've ever had. 
His name is Dr. Jason Fixler from Sinai Hospital in Baltimore. And I asked Jason to come up and share a few words about Juliana. And then I'll continue Julie's story. So uh, this is hard. Um, for those of you who know me, I'm the joker. I'm the guy that makes you laugh. I'm the guy that dropped his tie in the water thing over there while I was washing my hands. So this is not my normal <coughs> self. Um, but I wanted to share with you what did I learn from Juliana. Um, and I learned a lot. Um, the first thing I learned was, as many of you, if you know the family, Tammy's in charge. <laughs> you want something done, you go to Tammy. Well, I learned something new over the weekend. Tammy's not necessarily in charge. Juliana's in charge. Juliana wanted to be at home with her family, with her dog. And she did that. And so Juliana was more in charge than I ever knew. Um, she's much younger than I am, um, but we all have things to learn. Um, and to me, uh, for lack of birth, she was a living Bible story. Um, and she will teach me things as I go in the future. The thing that was remarkable is she didn't focus on the problem. She focused on how to leave the problem, how to get out, not in the hospital, how to get out of the hospital and have fun. How to, not that I had cancer, that that's not there. I am going to live life the fullest. My life doesn't, for lack of a better word, suck. It's, I am living it. And when you sit back and you complain about your car having a dent in it, um, some little problem, you, you just have to think about what she did and what she concentrated on. And you can tell that through the Facebook, through all the pictures that she would bring is her having fun at she may have she may have no hair she may have been sick two days prior but she was living life to the fullest and I think we all have to take that um, and learn from that you know when we're complaining about what's going on she didn't complain she just did it and I think that's important life is is that's what you're supposed to do um, that's what she taught me. I, you know, I wanted to share an anecdote. I, I thought about this for a while. Is you have the people that feel that the glass is half empty and the people that feel that glass is half full. So I thought about if I did an experiment with Juliana and I filled up a glass half and gave it to her and asked her, what, what do you think? I think she'd pick up that glass, take it to the, 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 the faucet and fill it all the way and say, why do you have a half filled glass? This is, the, and that's Juliana. And, um, it's an honor to, to say a little things about her. Um, she will be missed, but she will not be forgotten. And I think we'll, I think we'll live life differently because of her. So Juliana was scheduled to get her bone marrow transplant the beginning of this year, and we found out just days before. Um, we were able to find her birth mother to fly her here that she had the disease again. So I remember when we told her that she just sat on her mom's lap in her office, in, in Tammy's office, and just cried. And uh, we really didn't know if the transplant was even going to happen. So Johns Hopkins Hospital agreed to freeze the marrow and on April 29th of this year she received a bone marrow transplant. And the effects of the transplant were brutal. She gained about 20 pounds in fluid. Um, heart rate was 160, 180 for days at a time. It was, it was really bad. Um, she was hemorrhaging for months. She was a sick little girl but always found a way to smile, always found a way to to lift others up around her. She always had to be around her Maddie. Her Maddie was her best friend, you know, other than mom. Her, let me rephrase that. Her Maddie was her best four-legged friend. Make sure we're clear about that. 
So we received, uh, she, she was having some pains and we found out she had fluid around her heart and we were terrified that the transplant didn't work and we found out that in September of this year, oh my goodness, almost a month ago now, uh, a little more than a month ago I guess, that we found out that, that she had the disease for the eighth time. And Juliana, Juliana and I sobbed in each other's arms and, and we really didn't know what the future was going to hold. And then in October of this year, we uh, found out that she got an infection that was, was filling up her lungs. So we rushed her back to the hospital after Tammy drained about 510 or 20 milliliters of fluid off her right lung at home. That's a long story behind that. And then on the 7th of October, we were told that um, they had to put a, a tube down her throat to help her breathe and it was going to be very likely that she wouldn't live through that procedure. So on October 7th of uh, this year, we were told that we should say our goodbyes to Juliana. And we did. So a doctor, when Juliana's heart did stop, loved us enough to bring her back. And we had her for a few more weeks. All during these battles, or I'll call them wars, with cancer, Juliana tried to live as normal life as possible. She, she loved to swim and, and bake. She wanted to be a, a, a chef so bad when she grew up. She, she loved to fish. To me, fishing is like, you know, the most boring thing you can do on the planet. Why would you put a line in water and hope and pray a fish finds it? You know? Get, no, that's not my idea of fun. But I, I got it as I would watch her fish. It, it, it was the challenge of catching a fish. She was always up for a challenge. A few years ago, Give Kids the World gave us a trip to Florida. And one evening, um, Julianne and her son, son Tim were trying to catch some fish. And Tim was very patient and always has been with Juliana to um, help her catch the fish. And of course, I had my cameras in hand uh, because I may not have said this before, but I was always terrified that I was going to miss the very last day that Juliana would be, would be with us. So I started documenting her journey, every sneeze, every hiccup almost that she had for now nine and a half years. And we were out on that back deck and my cameras were in hand and Tim was trying to help her catch a fish and it was getting late, it was getting dark. And I said, you know, Julie, it's getting dark. I think we need to try again tomorrow. And this is on YouTube somewhere. I don't have the link in my head, but she, she turned her head to the left. I was standing to the left of her. And she just said, as a matter of fact, you know, just like she knows her own name. She goes, Daddy, I'm not a giver-upper. I'm not a giver-upper. And then moments later, with the help of Tim, she caught that fish. Juliana's willpower and the prayers of many thousands of people partnered with my amazing wife, Tammy. Juliana was unstoppable. Tammy was with Juliana every, for every needle, every scan, every bout with vomiting and diarrhea from Kikimo and months and months stuck in the hospital. When Juliana was five years old and fighting cancer for the first time, she cried, be, Julie cried, because Tammy was going to go home just for a few hours and come back later on just to take a little break. So Tammy stooped down and, and gave her a hug and made a promise to Julie that she would never, ever leave her in the hospital. And Tammy kept that promise till the very last day. They were a team. Juliana and Tammy were a team. Tammy told me years after that, that that she, Tammy, and Juliana were in this together. It wasn't just Juliana's illness, it was they were in this together. There were so many times when Juliana would be too sick to get out of bed or, or off the sofa, and I would sing a few words to this song that I could never get, I would never say the last words of the song, and I won't say them here today. I'm not a singer, but I've sung this, sang this song to her hundreds of times. I, I sang, Julie, you are my sunshine, my little sunshine. 
You make me happy when skies are gray. I sang that song to her countless times, including when she lay dead in our bedroom, tears flowing all over her from me. I sang it to her here several times in the last couple days, but she truly gave me courage. Her very short life showed me what love and excellence and tenacity and patience looks like. I, I, fa I got a failing grade in patience. You know, I, I was told by one of the, the people that helped treat her at, at uh, Hopkins that there were times when she, she and Tammy would get to Hopkins for a transfusion at 9 or 10 a.m. and by 4.30 the blood hadn't been funneled up through the hospital to get to her so they had to come back the next day and Tammy and, and Julie never complained. You know, I, I'm nowhere near close to mastering her, her skill sets and or her patience and her, her tenacity and her courage. And, and Juliana never really understood her global influence until the very end, until her last days when we were in intensive care. We did a live stream little update from Julie to the world. And within a couple of days, there were over 50,000 people who watched it. And, and, and I showed her that. And she was shocked. And I've been telling her this for years, that you know several million people know of you. And she, she, her words were, it's weird. <laughs> it's weird. Because to her, she's just Juliana. She's just a kid, you know? But as her dad, I know it was much more than that. The uh, prayers of, of tens of thousands of people in more than 200 co countries around the world, I think, hold us up during almost 10 years of Juliana fighting this, this battle, this war. One day, a few years back, I, we were downstairs, and I asked her a question. I said, why don't you complain about fighting cancer so many times? And I was to her right that time. And she looked over at me and said, Daddy, whining is for babies. What did you just say? <laughs> whining is for babies. She, she verbally yanked me by the collar. I didn't let her know that, obviously, at the time. But she, she verbally yanked me by the collar and challenged me without even knowing she was challenging me to not whine. And I try not to do that most days. Juliana's siblings, Rebecca and Matthew and Lindsay and Timothy and Christina, would spend countless days at the hospital while Juliana was getting uh, chemo and other things, because they were relatively young when Juliana first got sick. And, and they had to set their own lives aside for a long time for Juliana. And Julie and Tammy and I would try our best to save Juliana's life for a long time and parent five other kids, and it was so, so difficult. During the last couple of weeks of, actually the last, the week before she passed, or two, she was on a breathing tube for, for a few days, probably almost a week, I think. And we couldn't hear her voice. You know, it's, it's been amazing to me how, in hindsight, how much you miss a person's voice. You don't think about it many times until that voice is gone. But I missed her voice so terribly. And that day came when she looked over at us. And among other things, she tried to lip. She couldn't speak because the tube was down her throat. But she said something like, I want to get better so I can go home, or I want to go home so I can get better. And her voice, I missed it so much. I was standing outside the intensive care room when the hospital staff came in to take the breathing tube out. Yes, they do it right there in PICU, not in an operating room. And Tammy was by her side holding her hand, and I didn't want to pass out, so I stood outside the room. So as soon as they took the, the breathing tube out, I heard Juliana's voice for the first time in, in a week. And, um, it was the most precious sound. I, I don't even remember what she said, but just to hear her voice again was so precious. On October 16th of this year, she told me, I wish this would go away, her disease. I wish this would go away. She was talking about fighting cancer for the eighth time. 
on the very next day, I told Juliana, I said, you're an amazing daughter. She looked at me, she said, you're an amazing daddy. That week she told somebody else that Tammy and I were awesome. But Juliana is the awesome one. We were honored to be her parents. On October 18th, the very next day that she said that I'm an amazing daddy, I was, of course, cameras in hand, video in hand, taking pictures of her. And I said something like, how are you handling all this? And these are her words. May I quote? Stay positive. Don't think about the negative, and when you think about the negative, it just makes things worse. I'm really trying right now, baby. I'm really trying. So while she was in, in, in intensive care, she had this strapped to her right arm. They had stuff put in her wrist. And one day, I don't even remember how it came up, but she looked at me, she goes, lock and load. <laughs> I have no clue where our 14-year-old Eve ever had that, or heard that term. I don't know, Tim, you know, introduced her to it or what? I don't know, but, but uh, lock and load. I, I thought, did I just hear it? And she did it again, lock and load. Which really spoke volumes to me about her, her personality, her character. Today, I'm desperately trying to follow Juliana's advice, and that is, again, if you think about the bummers, it, will, it just bums you out more, she said, back in August 31st of this year. Again, if you think about the bummers, it will just bums you out more. She has touched the world in a way that I would have never expected when I started sharing her story with the hopes that tens of thousands of prayers would cure her from cancer. There's a, there's a part of a story in the 23rd Psalm, a, a verse, a piece of the verse. It says, a, a phrase or a paraphrase of that says that even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. And the only thing that Juliana was afraid of was needles. <laughs> needles, cancer. I mean, hello? She was not afraid of cancer. She didn't like it, obviously, but she was not afraid. The Thursday before she passed, she was so excited about going home. She was eating salad and wanting to see Maddie again. And if you haven't seen the little 30 second clip online, she was, her words, I'm brushing my hair so I can look pretty for Maddie when I go home. <laughs> That's how she said it. Juliana knew that she was going to beat cancer for the eighth time. She, she, she just knew it. There's a there's a Bible story about a, a man named Jairus. And I've read through the Bible, I cannot tell you how many times, and you know, some, some stuff in the Bible when you know, Robert married Susie and Susie had you know, Roberta and Roberta, I mean, you know, I get it. But there was a story about Jairus who, his daughter was dying one day. And he found out that Jesus was, was pretty close by, so he he ran to find Jesus to come heal his daughter. So while Jesus and Jairus were on the way back to help this man's daughter, Jesus was distracted by someone else who needed his help, which of course he stopped and helped the woman, but that delay caused the death of, or not caused the death, but the young daughter passed away. So a friend came to Jairus and said, you know, you don't need to bother Jesus anymore because your, your daughter's already gone. Well, the, the end of the story is Jesus still went and healed his daughter. But looking back now at that story, I understand that panic. I understand that terror. I understand that agony that I thought I understood when I read the text so many times, but now I see it in a different way, in a different light. 
On October 8th of this year, I described cancer in kids. I wrote, pediatric ca ca cancer is evil. It's a torturer. It is a murderer. It steals parents' attention from siblings of sick children. It, it's the thief of hopes and dreams of children with this disease. It's, it's a destroyer of joy in many children. It's a monster that turns smiles into tears and courage into fear. It, it's a series of diseases that is determined to kill, I wrote. It separates husbands from wives and wives from husbands. It assassinates, listen, it assassinates future inventors and musicians and artists and chefs like Juliana wanted to be and doctors and moms and dads. It leaves parents with a gaping hole in their heart forever. It's underfunded, and I'll get to that momentarily. The people on this planet can insist upon cures being found, and we're losing our future to diseases that can be cured. I believe they can be cured. No child should die of anything. That's why I am Honored to be on the board of directors for the Children's Cancer Foundation that has raised many, many millions of dollars that go directly to funding researchers that are working feverishly to, fi to find cures for pediatric cancer. So their representatives are sitting to your right, right here. So thank you guys for all you're doing and have done for kids. <coughs> Way back when I was, mercy, in my 30s, seems like yesterday, so I look in the mirror and, yeah, right more than yesterday. There was a, a news guy named Dan uh, who told a story. He said, in boxing, you're on your own. He said, there's no place to hide. He says, even at the end of the match, only one boxer has his hand up. This is in boxing. He said, that's it. He has no one to credit or to blame except the guy in the ring who won or lost. Rather, who boxed in high school, says his coach greatest goal was to teach his boxers that they absolutely positively, without question, had to be, his words, get up fighters, get up fighters. He said, if you're in a ring just once in your life, completely on your own, and you get knocked down, but you get back up again, it's a never to be forgotten experience. We have seen that with Juliana now seven, almost eight times. He says, and sometimes the only thing, listen, this, this last piece of this story grabbed me, and sometimes the only thing making you get up is someone in your corner yelling, get up, get up, get up. <coughs> Without knowing it, I think, at the time, Tammy and I surrounded Juliana with a get up mindset. Now I'm relying on Juliana had her not a give her up her attitude to help us to keep getting back up again. A couple years ago, I asked her to share some advice to people out there in the world that might be going through some tough times. And a piece of that little clip, she said, quote, you can get through it. I know you can. I'm staring at this the whole time I'm up here because Juliana would want me to get through it because she knows I can do it. There's a song called Hero. I'm not going to read all the words to it, but it says there's a hero if you look inside your heart. You don't have to be afraid of what you are. There's an answer if you reach into your soul and the sorrow that you know will melt away. And then a hero comes along with the strength to carry on and you're you cast your fears aside and you know you can survive, but so when you feel like hope is gone, look inside you and be strong. And you'll finally see the truth that a hero lies in you. I'm relying on Juliana to give us the strength to continue. In the last couple days, I received <coughs> hundreds of, of messages that I have not been able to read all of them. But Ray Rhodes, somebody I've never met, sent me a little note that I'd like to share. There is something my teacher shared with me that may be of help to comfort you. On a tombstone, there are three things beside the person's name. The day they were born, 
the day they died, and the dash in the middle. While we have fun at birthdays and recognize death through funerals, the real important part is neither the dates but the dash in the middle. It's celebrating each of those days in between, getting the most possible out of whatever dates we are afforded. It is that which defines our life. Ray Rhodes said, it may seem sad that Julie, Julie is gone, and it is, but the important thing to remember is that Julie understood exactly how important that dash truly was. She said, you can tell from your own videos that she did celebrate every day the best way she could. She did, she did understand the importance of getting through life to the full. There's plenty she never got to do, but there is plenty more she did that many who have many more days did not get to do. Many, uh, many who did not understand the real thing to celebrate was all these days making up the dash. When you look at it, Julie's dash is much longer and larger than most people's. Not because there were more days, but because they were fuller days. Fuller because that's how Julie chose to see them. Nothing can make her come back. Oh, I wish that was not true. But it's interesting, this person wrote, the fuller we leave our dash, it makes even ever more clear we are not done at the last date. Our dash interacts with other dashes, hers with yours and mine and anyone else's on Angels for Juliana, her page on Facebook. No, her dash is still moving forward and will be for a very long time. Now it's our job to continue what Julie showed us all. That it's not about our day of birth or our day of death, but the days between it. Julianne understands and understood what my teacher was saying. Now it's up to all of us to recall this lesson and to keep Julianne going in the way she would have wanted. Because we're all still growing our dash, and through us, she is still growing hers. I want to share some random thoughts. They're not going to be in chronological order, if you'll bear with me. In July last year, Giant Food was kind enough and partnered with the Children's Cancer Foundation to arrange for us to meet with Chef Robert Irvine in Washington, D.C., because Juliana, again, want, wants President wants to be a chef when she grows up. And I can remember when we met him that day, and he got on his knee and said that he was going to stay in touch with Juliana. Really? I mean, we're nobodies. We're just a family, you know. We, our name's not up in lights anywhere. We're just who we are. So, of course, I was respectful, and I said, but in my mind, in Daddy's mind, I was like, do not count on, you know, you getting a phone call from this guy again. Well, not only did we get phone calls, they did FaceTime several times, many times actually, which most of you have seen that online. And he would just call just to encourage her. I would text him, he texted me back, I said, she's having a really rough day. And he'd call or FaceTime just to, just to give her that little punch that she may have needed from somebody outside of family. And Robert, when you see this, it means more than you'll ever know. First lit, 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 lady, lady of Maryland, Mrs. Hogan is here today, and she first met Juliana a little more than a year ago at another hospital, and she just invested so much time with Julie. I mean, it's the governor's wife, the first lady of Maryland. And she came and hung out with a little girl that was so sick. When Juliana was in intensive care these last few weeks, she came again to Hopkins. And Juliana was unconscious. She had the, the tube down her throat. She didn't know she was even there. And then I got an email a week or so later and I found out that the first lady wants to come back again because Juliana was awake. But she came back again and invested time 
with our little girl, which you'll see online in a few days. I want to thank the friends and family who were kind enough to stop by and, and invest time with Julie and Tammy. Friends like Pam Hawkins who came by and just sat with Tammy and Julie. Just sat there. Derek Kleingen <coughs> and Melissa whose daughter is also struggling so terribly and Kelly and just came and sat. Sometimes they would bring meals. Just there's not a thank you big enough on the planet that can express my, my thanks. For, for Bonnie Cohen and her, her household that, that have been so kind with helping with Tim and Christina and Maddie when I would work from the hospital room. For the, I'm gonna leave a lot of people out, so forgive me for that, but the Bromley household who has been so kind to us over, over the last several years they, in a dramatic way. Juliana was happy. She, she didn't allow cancer to steal her joy. She was sad and cried at times, but always looked forward to getting back home from the hospital. She loved her family very, very much, very much, which, of course, Maddie is part of our household. But there was something I never quite understood about Julie <coughs> until a couple weeks ago. A guy named Dale has been a friend of ours for, oh, nine or ten years. Dale helped build our house. And he built a, a tight connection with our family. And for the last several years, he'd come over regularly to watch Survivor with a few of the kids. And I never got into it. So when I knew it was Wednesday night and they were going to watch Survivor, I'd go upstairs and get to work up in the office because I never under, I just was not into Survivor. That was just not my thing. But the week before Juliana passed away, I was ready to leave the hospital to go home for the evening. Tammy always stayed with her. And I've never watched a full episode of Survivor in, in my life. And I think that's been on TV for how many years? A long time, okay. How many? Yeah, it's crazy, a long time. Never watched the whole show through. But she asked me to stay and watch Survivor with her while she's in the hospital bed. It's going to be the last time. And I watched her more than I watched the show. And watching her, it just, it just illustrated to me so much about her. She would get so upset on the, about the wimps on the, on the show. <laughs> I mean, the sissies and the people that just couldn't get their stuff together, you know? It, was just, it would drive her out of her mind. It's like, get, please vote them off the show and however else they do it. She was just, just watching her frustration. Why this and left? So, uh, uh, oh, I, they're playing mind games with this one. You know. So she, she could spot a fake a mile away. But I'm so, so glad that I stayed and watched that show with her that night. She loved to play Candy Crush. To this day, my brain cells melt out of my ears just seeing the screen. But she, because of being in the hospital for so long and to pass the time, she would play Candy Crush and she would get to statuses and levels that people online are like, oh my God, I've been playing it for all these years and I haven't come anywhere close. So she was a real pro. She, she liked playing Heyday, which again, it's another game online that she play. She, she had a get it done attitude, and she, she could, like I said before, she, she could spot a fake a mile away, especially on these TV shows, or, or human beings. She, just a glance or two, or hearing people speak, she, she knew they were, they were fake. She hated hospitals. She had spent so much time in hospitals. She really did. But she never remembered being healthy. That, that speaks volumes to me. She never remembered being healthy. She was 14 and a half when she passed, and she first got sick at age five, no memory of being healthy. She loved to swim, even when her lungs were messed up from different <coughs> stuff going on in her. She could hold her breath all the way under the pool, come out the other end. I mean, this kid was nonstop. I can remember after her transplant, she was bloated up, 
full of fluid, heart rate going crazy, couldn't catch her breath. And of course I was doing my work out of her hospital room. And I was on the far side of the room, had, had of course my cameras in hand and she had not been out of bed and she had how many wires sticking out of her? 20, 30, it was an incredible amount of lines draining from her body. Again, it's all on YouTube. Um, and, and she looked at me, she, 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 she goes, watch this. She was going to walk from the bed that she hadn't been out of for quite a while to the sofa. <laughs> and she did it. She walked from the bed to the sofa. Her bond with Tammy is unbreakable. I mean, they have been together through this fight for a long time. I, I am going to miss Juliana's laugh. She, when she laughed, it wasn't a <laughs> it was a cackle, if you ever heard her laugh. It was, a, it was a, a very unique laugh. She would be annoyed when something was halfway done, you know, when different things would happen around the house and stuff was halfway done, or you know, I'm not going to name names, but she, she would get frustrated about certain things, you know? So there's so much that, that we can learn from Juliana's life, and her willpower would get her to go home. I can remember one time she was at one of the hospitals, and one of the doctors said, you know, I don't think you're going to be able to go home in a certain day. And he said, but, you know, if, if you can walk to the bathroom, I, I think there's a good chance that we could get you home. <laughs> We're talking about Juliana Carver here. Guess who walked to the bathroom? to get out of that hospital to go home. That's what Julie did. She loved to cook and bake with her mom. There were so many times when she was vomiting from treatment. Tammy was by her side, the bucket in hand, and I'm on the other side of Julie, and I'm a crybaby, as you can all know, and I'm crying my eyes out, because that's my baby girl. She's vomiting and patting my hand. <laughs> this is Juliana. This is a wimp when it comes to my kids. She was always determined to keep her schoolwork up. You know, she'd be in the hospital for a week or two or three, and she was determined to keep up on her, even in the hospital. I mean, she'd be sick as a dog, but she was determined to keep her her school work up. Of course, we didn't push that, obviously. Now, if, if I was to maybe share just a little, few words of advice for young people, make no excuses. Don't, Juliana was not one to make excuses, so don't make excuses. All, always be kind. She was kind. Always be strong. Juliana was strong. Never give up and always do what's right. That's what I take away from Julie. So some of you wonder, and I said this earlier, but I'll say it again. Some of you wonder why so many photos and v v videos I posted. Well, I never knew when it was going to be the last day or the last moment, and I would regret for a lifetime that I missed it. I will never be able to walk her down the aisle to attempt to give her away to the luckiest man on the planet. I'll never be able to hold your babies. Am I sad? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm beyond sad. Am I enraged that she's gone? Yeah, I think I'm doing okay on the rage part here today so far. There's some organizations and people that I'd like to thank that have been very kind to us over the years. One is Believe in Tomorrow. They have given Juliana so much joy that I cannot describe to you. Casey Cares has also been very kind to our family. Cool Kids Campaign, represented here today, has put many, many smiles on Juliana's face. Children's Road to Recovery is an organization founded as a result of that family having their son pass away from a disease that would provide gas cards regularly to us to help us get back and forth from the hospital. 
Make-A-Wish. When Juliana first got diagnosed with cancer at age five, I don't know the details behind it, but Make-A-Wish was contacted and Juliana chose a pool and she has spent hundreds of hours, I don't wanna exaggerate and say thousands, but hundreds of hours in that pool. Give Kids the World gave us a trip to Florida, to Disney World, and Robert Irvine has been such a blessing with his organization. And the Strong Hope F F Foundation is an organization that um, encourages people to get involved in sports to raise money to find cures for cancer. I'd like to thank again Dr. F F Fixler here and Dr. Unguru and Wiley that took care of Juliana for nine years. They were and are extraordinary. And the nurses at Sinai Hospital and at Hopkins, bear with me, I'm winding down. It won't be a sermon for three hours, I promise. I'd like to thank her family, Juliana's family, and her fans in 220 plus countries around the world that have followed and or prayed for Juliana for a lot of years. Emily and Sadie, I'd like to thank, they were Juliana's hospital buddies. Many times they were in the hospital at the same time. They would go in each other's rooms. They would watch TV together. They would be in the playroom together. They would, they would just hang out. They were hospital buddies. A few weeks before, also Emma Carpenter, I'm sorry, I almost forgot. Emma was not in the hospital, but she was a very, is a very close friend. And they would hang out and just, just be girlfriends because when you're sick, you know, not too many people want to be around you. But Emma was not afraid. Where are you, Emma? Are you here? Hi, baby. Thank you. A couple of few weeks before Juliana passed away, she, was, she sat on the sofa for days at a time. And a little friend of hers named Aubrey, I called and contacted somehow. And I, I asked her, I said, well, would you just come over and just sit with her on the sofa just, just for a few hours, just to, just to be her friend? And Aubrey came over to sit with her on the sofa because Juliana was too weak to run and play. I'll never forget that, Aubrey. Thank you. I'd like to thank Tammy for being her full-time nurse. Unless you have a child with a life-threatening illness, you don't know what investment of time that takes. I'd like to also thank Dave Greenwalt, who's here from, from the Northern News. He allows me to write articles in the Northern News and just share thoughts and inspiration to help his readers and to share Juliana's story several times. I appreciate that, Dave, and I always will. I'd like to thank Arena, who is the biological mother of Juliana and Kirk Christina, that she could have said no. She could have said, look, you know, pardon me, that I haven't seen these kids in a long time. You're on your own. But I remember her words to me via internet. She said, how could I say no? She flew to America with the help of family and tried to help Juliana. I thank God for giving me the hunch to have that meeting that day when we first heard about Juliana. If I wouldn't have followed up on that hunch that day, we would have never met Juliana. I have to believe that Juliana's spirit is in heaven. And if you want to see Juliana again, would you please pray this prayer after me? Dear God, I don't understand why certain things happen in the world. I do want to see Juliana again one day. Please forgive me of all the bad things and the sins I've done. I believe that Jesus paid the penalty for all those sins. Please make me a part of God's family 
so I can see Juliana again. Amen. I miss her voice so much. Tammy. John's pretty much said everything, but um, I wrote a, a couple of things down I wanted to say. I remember when we found out Julie had cancer back in February 2007, asking why. But um, over the years, I realized that she was an orphan in Belarus, and she never would have received treatment. She would have ended up dying there in some sterile hospital room with no one that loved her, no one that cared about her. So I feel like God gave her to us to love and take care of so we could get her treatment and give her time, time to have a really good life, time to impact a lot of people around the world. I think Julie accomplished more in her 14 years than a lot of people do in 80 plus years. She was, she was an awesome daughter and a sister and a friend to us. She helped raise awareness and funding for cancer research. She helped encourage thousands of people with her incredibly positive attitude and her courage. She taught us to never lose hope and to never give up. I told her the last week when she was lying in PICU, um, she still had that tube in her throat. I was like, Julie, I am so glad that I got to be your mom. I'm so glad I'm your mom. We were really, really close. Um, she brought an incredible amount of joy and love into my life. And I know I'm going to miss her every single day for the rest of my life. Um, I wanted to read a poem called I Only Wanted You by Vicki Holder. It says, they say memories are golden. Well, maybe that is true. I never wanted memories. I only wanted you. A million times I cried. If the love alone could have saved you, you never would have died. In life, I loved you dearly. In death, I love you still. In my heart, you hold a place no one else could fill. If tears could build a stairway and heartache make a lane, I'd walk the path to heaven and bring you back again. Our family chain is broken and nothing seems the same. But as God calls us back one by one, the chain will link again. I'd like to end with, almost end, with a DVD that somebody I've never met put together. You think, Tim, that you could get that started for me, please? Juliana has a way to make the whole world smile. Juliana has a saying to make us strong for a while I'm not a giver up -er, cause whining is for babies I'm not a giver up -er, but I swear it ain't easy cancer better fear you cause now you've only gotten stronger it better start running cause you're not held back any longer now you're cruising with your angels Making rainbows in the sky When we're having a hard day We'll just think of you And know you're by our side Always and forever You'd say Always and forever You'd say I'm not a giver up Whining is for babies I'm not a giver up But I swear it ain't easy Can't believe you're gone though We're still missing you like crazy We're not giver-uppers But 
missing you ain't easy I'm not a giver up Cause whining is for babies I'm not a giver up But I swear it ain't easy We're sorry for the pain We just don't understand But now you're being held In the palm of your father's hands Now you're cruising with your angels Making rainbows in the sky When you're having a hard day We'll just think of you And know you're by our side Always and forever Always and forever You'd say not a giver up, cause whining is for babies. I'm not a giver up, but I swear it ain't easy. And now you're cruising with your angels, making rainbows in the sky. And when we're having a hard day, we'll just think of you and know we're by your side. sunshine, my little sunshine, you make me so happy, my skies are gray, I miss you so very much.
sunshine. My little sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. Thank you for being my sunshine. You're so comforting. Don't give me strength to keep going. I need you so bad.
just child. You make me happy. Then skies are gray. Thank you for being my sunshine. So he's called in. Three on either side, please.
Everyone gathering in, come on in closer, please. Are you good? Are you okay? I think so. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. say a short prayer just so I can get the help that I need from God's grace. Father, I thank you for your help today and I ask for your grace and your kindness and your mercy. And I'm willing to do this. Jesus I'm reading from a message Bible. It is a paraphrase. It would be a whole lot easier to understand. All praise to the God and Father of our Master, Jesus the Messiah, Father of all mercy, God of all healing, counsel. He comes alongside us when we go through hard times. And before you know it, He brings us alongside someone else who is going through hard times so that we can be there for that person just as God is there for us. We have plenty of hard times, and that comes from following the Messiah. But no more so than the good times of His healing comfort. We, we get a full measure of that too. Julie has done that. Juliana has done that for so many people. Only the record of heaven will be able to tell. In 1 Thessalonians, the 4th chapter, in verse 14, 
it starts out, he says, and now, friends, we ask you to honor those leaders. Excuse me. The wind messed me up. The master is coming. And regarding the question, friends, that has come up about happened to those, what happened to those who already dead and buried. We don't want you to be in dark any longer. First of all, you must not carry on over them like people who have nothing to look forward to, as if the grave and the last word has the last word. Since Jesus died and broke loose from the grave, God will certainly bring back to life those who died in Christ. And then this, we can tell you with complete confidence, we have the Master's word on it, that when the Master comes again to get us, those of us who are still alive will not get a jump on the dead and leave them behind. In actual fact, they will be ahead of us. The Master himself will give the command, Archangel Thunder, God's Trump, will blast. He will come down from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise. They go first, then the rest of us are still alive at the time we call up with them into the clouds to meet the Master. And the paraphrase says, all oh, we will be walking on air. Then there will be one huge family reunion with the Master. So reassure one another with these words. Unto the mercy of Almighty God, we entrust the soul of our beloved Juliana. We commit her body. To the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And this, in the same sure, certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the scripture that God gave me concerning her. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow her. And I know that is going to happen. Let us pray. The Lord bless you and keep your broken hearts. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you.
Hi everybody, I'm Joanne Lee Cosley. I would just like to thank all of you for helping me get through cancer for the third time. And you please mean a lot to me and my family. And it's a bit hard going through it, you know, cancer with everything at this age. And it's hard for me and my family. So thank you so much for playing. I love you all. <laughs> Is it on? <laughs> Hi, my name is Joanna Cogwin. I've been through some stuff, and I don't really know some people out there, but you may have it. So if you're having a hard time, you can get through it. Because if I can get through it, then you can. And you know you can. I'm Joanna Carver and I'm not a giver up. Thank you so much for playing for me. It means a lot. 